Hey. Hi there, Dom. I'm so sorry. That's all right. Not a problem. I, I, I don't know what I should have double checked last night, but uh, That's not a kind of brushed this morning. Here we are. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Good. 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 Well, thank uh, you where for, are you? Uh, Newbrick, down where in Berkshire. Oh, I was born in Basingstoke. Yeah, up in the Arno Basingstoke. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not far. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining me today. Um, very kind of you. No worries. Um, thank you. So, Sorry, mate. That's all right, it's not a problem. So um, we get started. So first question, how did you get into ventral ventriloquism? I started uh, when I was 12 years old and there was a ventriloquist from Reading that was on New Faces in 1987 called Jimmy Tamley. And I was watching this TV talent show with my family when I was 12 and they watched it because he was around the corner. I watched it for the same reason, but uh, they watched it and they were entertained by him. But I, I, I saw something in it. I got this passion from that moment seeing a ventriloquist where he was getting laughed at and he was playing with, you know, playing with dolls primarily. And, and I thought that was really cool. So I, he lived literally five minutes from my house. So the next day, my friend who lived opposite him said, uh, do you want his autograph? So I went round to get his autograph and then I asked him for lessons. And, and I was just totally fascinated with the ventriloquist world from then on. And, and now 33 years later, I'm writing a book on it and writing a book on ventriloquists from all over the world. So it's, it did become a passion when I was 12. So I've been doing this for 30, nearly 34 years. So how do you sort of start learning ventriloquism? and what sort of the process to learning it? Uh, the process is, well, he started to give me lessons and I wrote it for this ventriloquist. And so he, he told me to go away and get a book. Uh, he didn't tell me to go away. He was very polite, <laughs> but um, I did go away. And I, I got this book by Ray Allen called Got All the Gear. And it taught you all the basics. And to be a ventriloquist, obviously you have to, um, this is how I tell people if they want to learn. So teeth together, lips open, slightly leave your lips open a bit. Uh, not like this not like that but if you if you do it slightly because you look a bit weird if you ah, not. all right so teeth together lips slightly open practice the alphabet and this is how i do the alphabet so this is how you start learning by doing the alphabet looking in the mirror so i go a a b b c c d d e e f f g g h h i i j j k k l l and so on so it gets to the end but there's like five maybe six letters that are quite difficult so you have to get past those letters. Like when you do the B letter, that's very difficult. And you have to use your tongue behind your mouth to create those sounds. So you're substituting a B for a D. It sounds like D. So you go in a D and then you're saying B, you go D, D, D. And behind the mouth, you go in D, D, D. So it's all substitution and um, technicalities that, that get you past that. You work on those letters over and over again. Then you start putting words and sentences together. And when they start sounding good, you can then um, build a character or save up for a puppet, which I did when I was uh, 12, 13 years old. So what was your first puppet? First puppet was a character. I named it after the teacher, Jimmy. Uh, it was a, this is really strange because within two weeks of Jimmy winning the TV talent show, my sister came home from school with a ventriloquist dummy. And Ray Allen's book, Got the Gear, came out. So these three factors came together. Really, they found me, if you know what I mean. So yeah. I started learning. I had a teacher. I had a book. I had a dummy. And I had a mirror uh, upstairs. So I practiced and practiced. Um, and I kept going back to this ventriloquist. And he knew that I wasn't going to go away. So uh, he booked me as a roadie for about 10 years until I turned professional. So it, it was the first dummy was a little plastic ginger character which if you go on eBay, you'll see loads of them. They're, they're called parchalins or something. They're, they're um, plastic, very scary, uh, big eyes, eyelashes, ginger hair and a check, check cap. And I used that character in my first ever show in assembly in school when I was 13. So um, how, what was your first professional gig? How did you sort of get into it professionally? All oh, right, professionally. Now it takes a long time to get an act together. So it took me from age 12 to 22 those 10 years I started to do little shows so I was doing charity shows talent shows and in the talent shows I had 15 20 minutes but I would get always get into the finals in the talent shows I've done about 30 to 40 talent shows in about eight years and I'd, I'd come first second or third 
mainly first because there was always singers and dancers and I, I was the only ventriloquist in the talent show. So I would uh, always do really well. I won over £10,000 over those eight years. So it, it was um, it was a really good learning curve and it really gave me confidence to carry on to do ventriloquism. So I would do all these shows building up to being professional. So when I was 16, I was uh, booked by a local club to do uh, a cabaret in uh, in their club there was a comedian hosting it a live band and they booked me as as their speciality so i've done about 25 30 minutes and i put a little bit of naughty stuff in there i was only 16 but i i did it but when, my first professional summer season really and professional full 45 minute show was in 1997 after all the talent shows um, I went out to be a professional in Great Yarmouth and this agent saw me. I did a showcase. You have to do showcases back then to get holiday parks and things. So I learned my craft really in holiday parks. So when I was 22, I was, um, yeah, it was around about April. I done my first holiday park and then I had about 100 dates throughout that year. And every night got better and longer and stronger. And I really strengthened the act throughout that time. But um, so that was like age 22. But I'm just trying to think. Uh, but back to when I started, it's, it's, it's around about the early 20s or the late late yeah. teens, you know, when I started. So how do you sort of come up with the ideas for your puppets? Like, how do you create all the characters in that? Because you've got Arthur Largo and people like that. Is it a long process sort of creating the characters or? It, it is because it takes a long time to get them built. So I've got... Um, I, I've got a lot of characters like I, I wanted a little dog, a really cute little dog. So I got this little dog made and I was going to I just had this name called Chi Chi. So I said, um, I'd like him to blink. So uh, you put a little blinker, squeeze the foot and he blinks. I want him really cute. Hi, my name's Chi Chi. Uh, I just wanted a cute dog. And then he just had a squeaky voice like Orville, you know. Yeah. And then I started to do him in pantomime and then I started to get bigger gigs. Um, uh, and then I realized he's too small. He's great yeah. for television, but uh, I'm not I'm not getting into television right now. So it's very difficult to use this like at the Albert Hall or, or the big Butlins gigs that I work. Uh, I have used him and he goes down great because they've got screens behind me. But um, so I need to get him be built a bit bigger. So, so in your head, you're creating characters and you think, well, this is going to work. He's so cute because he's small, but it doesn't work for big venues, you know. And then uh, I'm working on this character now, which um, I've had him for about 10 years, but he's called Rod Vegas. Is that Don or Nick? Yeah. Hey, Don. <laughs> hey, it's the big bad Don. My name is Rod Vegas. I'm playing the guitar. And so uh, he's got a prop added to him. So uh, all the music is pre-recorded. Is that why this thing don't work? Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm trying to be nice and innovative, if, you know? I can never yeah. say that word. In in innovative, yeah. right? And uh, if you add props to it, it just makes it more dynamic and brings it up to date. So he plays the guitar. We've got loads of pre-recorded tracks that stop and start. There's comedy, uh, you know, linked to all of them. And and it's bringing music to the show as well, which is great. And uh, I love Rod Vegas because he, he gives me that. Um, he's completely different to Arthur Lager, which Arthur Lager is just a comedy based character, like a sitcom character, you know, um, like One Foot in the Grave with Victor Meldrew or um, Count Arthur Strong, I've just been watching recently. Yeah. Really strong characters in their own right. So, but this is just a, a bit of fun with music. See it, dudes. Um, and then I'm adding characters all the time. I like to be um, topical as well. And this is topical. Sorry, you keep seeing my forehead. Uh, so, uh, this was um, just made a. a I'm trying to think how long ago, just over a year ago. Uh, I know, yes. Uh, don't go, don't go to work, don't go to work, stay home, go to work. I know, yes. Uh, you don't go out unless you're in six. Um, uh, on what is it? Sometime in May or June, yes. Then everyone is free, everyone's free. <laughs> so I got a Boris made last, um, yeah, two, at the end of 2019 before he became prime minister because I wanted to be topical, but I'm not a political act at mm. all. I have no idea what it means. I'm not really into that sort of thing, but he's visual. I've done a lot of stuff yeah. with uh, Boris online, you know, so, yeah. so, so, so that works. But um, my main character, Arthur Lager, is the one yeah. where um, 
I had a manager and he said, oh, you should get an old man character in the act. And all ventriloquists, you can Google ventriloquists, you'll see that they've got an old man, they've got a monkey, they've got a cheeky little boy, or they've got the mask routine, you know, everyone does the same routine. So I, I try not to follow suit. I try and be a little bit different. Uh, we all try and be a little bit different. But um, after Largo, I put him in the act and it worked like that because everyone's related. Everyone can relate to an old character. It's your neighbor, your uncle, your, your granddad, you know. So after Largo came in the show and then he just took over. And, and because he took over, he, he really, yeah, it's natural, isn't it? It is natural. It's on hilarious. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hello, Dominic. Hi. Hi. Okay. How, how are you? Mr. Isaacs. I'm good. Yeah. I've had the jab. Nice. Yeah. He's had the jab. Yeah. Yeah. yeah good. He's had the jab. Good. good. Yeah. And, and uh, you had the jab. I had the jab. Yeah. And the doctor said that it'll wear out. Your arm will go numb after about an hour. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that, that's, <laughs> guess that. that's my old flu joke. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, so Arthur Laga is just the main character. And he, I always start with him and sometimes I end with him as well because they want to see him back yeah. later in the show. But to create his character, I kind of worked on the voice while he was being built because he was built in America originally. And I got th three Arthur Lagers made. I used one on Britain's Got Talent. And then after Britain's Got Talent, I started to use a puppet creator called Peter Pullen who made Orville the Duck and Imu, loads of famous characters. And I, I uh, booked him to make Arthur Lago, he made Pongo, he made Chi Chi. He's maybe about 15 characters. Uh, but he reinvented Arthur's face. And so Arthur, it looks like he's got a little bit famous and he's had a bit of work done, you know, Botox and stuff. Yeah. But uh, I have, I look a lot better. <laughs> so uh, he's a bit, you know, more full in the face. You put light on, what? You put light on. Everyone's put a bit of weight on in the lockdown. Yeah, feels a bit tight at the back, Isaac. <laughs> it's not Isaac, it's Dominic. Yeah, I can't say that. Okay, Dominic, Isaac. <laughs> yeah, so so that, it, it, he was one of the easiest characters to build. And, and although the process took long of him getting made and yeah. built and then building the character, it's, I'd probably say um, six months, really, you need to, to actually, once you get the character, you need to work him into the act. It's, uh, there's so many dummies lying around here that don't get used because I think they're a great idea. And then, yeah. You get it, and you just don't click with it, you know? It's like going on first dates. You need to click with that character. Yeah. You need to bounce off each other, you know? Oh, I like doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Not like that. Okay. See ya. <laughs> yeah, that was Arthur. Yeah. Um, so when you've created all your characters and things like that, how do you come up with all the material for each of the different characters? Like what you're going to say and what jokes you're going to do in that? Yes, I, I'm uh, very inspired by everyday life and characters. Something can happen or I could see, see see something happen. I write a lot during my show. So the process really is very difficult. If I'm not recording the show, it's difficult to remember what I did. So I get a really big laugh that's not usually there. It's because I've ad-libbed or something has happened in the audience and the puppet is straight on it, you know, because um, if, if I've got half a lager and somebody trips up or... Uh, I did this ad lib once and then uh, this lady walked across the room and she had a baby in her arms mm. but she walked right in front of me on the dance floor and then uh, the whole audience could see her so you have to make sure the audience can see what you can see or you won't get a laugh so I, I, I was still talking to the audience but I made Arthur do this he was watching the lady <laughs> and he went oh look Steve what there's another ventriloquist so he clocked her and then she's holding a baby. It looks like she's a ventriloquist. The instant laugh. And I really, really want ladies with babies to walk across because it's one of the biggest laughs in the show that I created. And so uh, mm. I love doing that gag when, when it arises, you yeah. know. And, and if they're sat at the front and they stand up with the baby, I instantly stop the act and we're on them straight away to get that gag in the show. Doesn't always happen. No. But uh, not on a saga cruise. Not on a saga <laughs> cruise. No, no babies allowed. But uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so so, so uh, I write a lot when I'm on stage. Mm. But I've written so much over the years. I, I could be lying in bed asleep. And, um, and I could wake up, think of a joke. And I need to write it down. Or I usually put it in the phone. And six months later, I clear my phone, which I, you just reminded me I have to do again. The phone is full up with ideas and songs. 
um, sketches, routines, uh, lots of gags, you know. So I, I write most of my stuff. There are some classic gags that you would have heard before, but it's, uh, you know, from the good old days that it just fits within the show. So it's nice to to add a bit of your own. I, I'm still finding my own style, and I've been doing this for 23 years as a professional. So to, to, um, to it, you never stop creating in this job as well. So um, it's, it's very important to be, to be yourself, find yourself, you know, find your own style and originality, which is uh, really important. So, um, yeah. 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 <laughs> is that a horse? Yeah. Oh, is that, are you a little horse? I'm a little tired because uh, I was a little bit late. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's all right. And, uh, and I just cut up basically. So <laughs> it's lazy. <laughs> Sleep. <laughs> there you go. It's gone. So, um, what ventriloquists have inspired you over the years? Oh, uh, well, this the first one, Jimmy Tamley. Uh, he really inspired me. He's my best mate even today. So I've known him forty year, forty three years. Uh, Keith Harris with Orville and Cuddles. Keith was really good to me. I done my first TV show with Keith, national television show, when I was sixteen, uh, fifteen or sixteen, and, and he was just great to me then. And then we kept meeting and we stayed in touch over the years. Uh, he gave me a few characters as well. So Keith Harris was one of the greatest, most successful ventriloquists in the UK. And uh, in the early 90s, a ventriloquist called Ron Lucas came over to the UK. And Ron, um, I, I went to the TV studios when he was filming his show. And before they started to film the evening's entertainment, they found out there was a young ventriloquist in the audience. And so Ron got me out and I stood on his TV set and he, he made me do the alphabet. So I've done what I did earlier, you know, yeah. with the alphabet. And I didn't move my lips and I, the studio audience went crazy. Got me a round of applause, sat back in my seat. But me and Ron as well stayed in touch since then. And he came over to the UK four years ago. We'd done two shows together. And he's still, I mean, the, the New York Times called him the, the world's best ventriloquist. And I still think to, to this day, he's, you know, he's one of the greatest we've ever had. And and we're, we're in touch and I'm writing a book, as I say, and Ron Lucas has done the foreword for my book, which means a lot. So it's it's it, it's a small community. Um, there's so many more in America, but the community, we all know each other. You know, I, I know Paul Zerdin and uh, Nina Conti. I've met a couple of times and they're the ones, you know, that everybody knows about. And I, I knew the older generation of ventriloquists that sadly we've lost as well. I was always writing to them and getting to know because I, I, I not just want to be a ventriloquist, I'm really passionate about the art. So my book is um, paying tribute to those ventriloquists before us. Uh, all my old letters are in there from, from them, you know, the correspondence that we had when I was starting. So you can see the process and my interest in not just earning money from doing what I do, traveling around the world but actually um learning from their experiences and being passionate about what they've given me which is the path to my career you know so um and i do talk i hope i'm fulfilling your questions you are, i'm yeah. making up for not being here 20 minutes that's, that's fine it's fine <laughs> so what would you say is the hardest part about being a ventriloquist the hardest part is the material um coming up with something new all the time and in the past, I've had a, like the guitar dummy. I'd never seen that before. And I've had a dancing dummy, which is very technical. And I'm not a technical person. Um, so you know, the dancing dummy was a, one of my dummies. was like a pop star. And I've done this in 2011, like nine, ten years ago in a summer show. And he stood behind a screen. And the screen uh, had like um, a projector that projected some dancing legs, which I pre-recorded with a real dancer. So it looked like the dummy was dancing, you know? So coming up with the new ideas uh, all the time is very difficult because you can't, you can't just be a ventriloquist with a dummy on the knee anymore. You have to wow people, you know? Mm -hmm. You look on YouTube, it's all been done. All the ventriloquist acts and the ideas, they've been revamped. You can reinvent them and make them more up to date or you could take them from a hundred years ago and, and make it look new again. But, yeah. um, I, I tend to not do that. I try try and invent stuff like the guitar and the uh, dancing dummy. And I've got loads more ideas, you know. Yeah. I've invented a new show which opened um, 
a day before the lockdown, sadly. So a, a year ago, we opened it in March and it closed the next night. So I've done two nights of the tour and I had about another nine dates around the UK and I cancelled all those. So that show is called Arthur Lager Gets Real. And I'm, I'm basically telling the story of Arthur when he was born, when he was a seven year old and he was 20, 40, 60. And as you saw him just then. So it's one hour and it's a show all about Arthur Lager's life. And he's telling you stories about when he used to hang out with the Beatles and, and that sort of thing. So it's, yeah, yeah, it's really, um, really, really good fun coming up with something new. And so the, the ventriloquism wise, the material, I think. Yeah. yeah. So is it hard to try and be, when you look back and see that all the sort of the material and the jokes have been done before, is it hard to try and be original? Or do you find, have you come up with an idea that's not been done before? You know, you found out a bit later it has been done before. Yes, all that. Yeah. Right, researching my book, um, I, I've interviewed so many ventriloquists around the world and from India and China, all over America, Canada and um, Kuwait, you know, and that, and that guy is uh, Basil, his name is, he's the only ventriloquist in Kuwait because it's not really, comedy is not allowed. It's a, he gets away with it, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's an incredible thing, really, because I've discovered i've discovered really great ventriloquists and i guess i'm not being big-headed but I'm, I'm kind of paying compliment to myself in a way that the ideas that i've come up with and and written down because I, I write stuff every day so ideas have gone in the book and and i've discovered like youtube clips of ventriloquists 60 years ago and they're doing the routine that i've just just wrote last week do you know what i mean <laughs> so i think it's because we're very limited as a ventriloquist you're limited to the ideas you can do yeah. you can make anything talk you know you can make that horse talk or or something you know you can make something um like like in the hand the distant voice is a very popular thing but this was happening a hundred years ago you go hello hello what you know so uh, oh there he is <laughs> so um you can come up with loads of i new fresh ideas with old routines like like the distant voice or drinking a bottle of water so i i started to do a bottle of water when someone told me like 20 uh, 16 years ago they said a, a guy used to use a bottle of water in the act. So I put a bottle of water in, wrote this little routine about 15 years ago, started to do it, and it just got a really good laugh. So I do that. It's about a five-minute routine. I've been doing it 15 years. About two years ago, I started to research for my book, and that, that guy comes back, and then I, I hear how he started to do the bottle of water routine. And uh, it's a completely different routine to what I do. But he uh, he turned up and he he lost his dummy, misplaced his luggage, couldn't find his puppet, so he just went to the bar and he used a bottle of beer, you know. So he started to do a bottle of beer. So it's funny how some routines actually start, and it's because they've forgotten something or yeah. forgotten to turn zoom on, you know, that sort of thing. We're very forgetful. <laughs> yeah. Um. So you'll be best known for doing Britain's Got Talent. Um. Seven years ago now, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 How did that come about? What? How do you get on to? Have, it's got talent about it's it's um well I, I auditioned for a show called paul o'grady's got talent and this is 2006 i think and and there was just three judges there i'd done my little event act i've got a lot of laughs i think oh i might get on this it's a brand new tv talent show coming out and i was ready at that time i was um early 30s or late 20s mm -hmm. so i thought oh this is going well so um Never heard again. And then Paul O'Grady moved to Channel 4. So they scrapped the idea, sold the idea to ITV or Psycho. Simon Cow got hold of it, called it Britain's Got Talent. Bang. It's all over the world. So um, in 2007, I watched Britain's Got Talent and thought, because uh, a lot of the acts, uh, the, the acts that I know, comedians and magicians, we all talk, you know. And so oh, did you see the show last night? Yeah. It's, there's a few amateurs on there. I don't think it's for us. So the professionals kind of stayed away for quite a while, you know? Yeah. And, but the next year, 2008, I got a phone call from them asking if I'd do it, but I was booked out on cruise ships. So, I, so I'm not available. 2009, I got a call. 2010, I got a call every year. And then 2013, 
me and my wife had like a six month old um, baby and and I had like two months off because I wanted to be home. I just done a pantomime and I wanted some time off. So I was available in January 2013. Britain's Got Talent um, emailed me to say, we've got this brand new TV show. Um, it's a TV variety show. Can we, can you give us your number and we'll have a chat? And so they don't tell you it's a talent show or Britain's Got Talent, but they know that the acts will answer the call if they say it's a TV variety show. Yeah. So I did. So uh, I spoke to them. They went, oh, hi. hi. Uh, and the producer told me, yes, Britain's Got Talent. I said, oh, I, I don't want to do a talent competition. Uh, I had done one previously. I'd done one in 97. And, um, and I didn't get anywhere. <laughs> so I went away to, to practice me act, you know. So anyway, they called me and they said, well, if, if, you, uh, if you do think about coming, there is a space for you. We're at the London Palladium next week. You can choose any day. They basically wanted to work around me, which sounded great. So I thought, okay, they want me on the show. So I called them back about an hour later after talking to my wife and said, I've got nothing to lose. I've got no work for a, for a couple of weeks. Uh, it's at the Palladium, which is a theatre I worked for nine months as an usher. And uh, I loved being an usher at the Palladium. It's one of the most famous theatres in the world. So I, lo I love working there. I love being there. So to do my act there, which is what I do, and they're inviting me on. Okay. I, I, it's a no brainer, you know. Yeah. So I went there. I'd done the act. One thing I remember was I went on my own. And I was there all day, like eight in the morning until eight at night. It was such a long day and draining day. But I didn't have anyone with me when I came off. And when I came off, I was buzzing because the, the whole audience stood up. The judges were buzzing and I went down really well. I, I done about six minutes. I got laugh after laugh. It's very sad because when the audition went out, they showed 20 minutes. No, tw I wish they showed 20 minutes, 20 seconds. That's all they showed was 20 seconds. And so, but I know that I'd done a great six minutes at the Palladium that night. And I came off and I phoned my wife and, and said, I'm, you know, I've just got through it. It was fantastic. I got four yeses. And then you wait two or three months. Then you go and find out if you're going to be on the show. I found out that I was. I kept that secret for my family. And then when it went out on telly, I got all my family, nieces, uh, nephews, brothers, sisters, mums and dads. I only got one of each. And then, um, and then I didn't tell them the results. They didn't know if I was through or not. So it was really great seeing their reaction because uh, I did get through and then I went to the live shows but it was it was between that process of because they they want you to send loads of videos in of what you're going to do on the semi-finals and the finals you have to pre-write the material so I started to put the act together and I, I've got a big skunk puppet called Pongo I was going to do him I was going to do a little bit of Chi Chi the dog mm. uh, for the semi-finals and they said oh no can you bring back excuse me can you bring back half a lager and uh, I went, oh, OK, right, they just want to see Arthur. So I brought him back and then I wrote a few routines. And then my wife, there was a dummy lying on the floor in, uh, in our attic, in our loft area, where it's called. And, um, and she said, that, that could be Simon Cow. You should turn him into Simon Cow. So that puppet I sent to Portugal, uh, a guy I recently found out about in Portugal that renovates puppets. So I said, I said, I'll send you this puppet. Can you make it look like Simon Cow? It came back about three weeks later, a week before the live show semi-finals. Yeah. And it looked like Simon Cow. I opened it. We looked at each other, me and my wife, and we laughed. And we thought, this is going to be good. This is going to be fun. So I wrote a couple of minutes for it. And I didn't tell the producers that I had Simon Cow. I kept it secret. And if you're going to go on the show, have something up your sleeve. You need an ace to surprise the producers, not just the viewers, you know, because um, they don't like that. They like to know everything that's going on. But I, I thought the only way I'm going to get through is to surprise them. Yeah. So I, I kept Simon Cow in the box, but I the routine that I did write, which was like two minutes with Arthur Lager, uh, I'd done a bit of stand up, a couple of gags, got Arthur Lager out, done the gag and he finished on a rap. And then it was, um, a gangster's rap, I think it was. And and that was it. 
but that would not have got me through to the final. You had to do something different. So Simon Cow was waiting there. So I went out and done my last rehearsal with them. Ant and Dick were in the jeans. We're doing the rehearsal in the daytime. And then I, I pulled out our falaga, done the routine. Um, they done the polite pol uh, applause, you know, with the crew and stuff. I put him in and I did tell the producer, I said, I've got something a little different at the end. And she, OK, fine. We'll try it in the rehearsals. I pulled out Simon Cow, and then all he said was, uh, I did not like it. I absolutely loved it. It was one line that he uses nearly every day on the show, you know. So I knew that that would get a good reaction. So when I'd done that, I looked over to Ant and Deck. They were doubling over, laughing their heads off. The producers run down from um, behind the scenes, and they said, can you do this tonight? I, yes, I want to. And, and then what you see on the semi-finals, uh, when I first pulled Simon Cow out, that's what actually happened. And it was, it was magic in that studio. It was incredible. And, and then obviously a week later, I got through as the wild card and had Sunita made. So yeah. it, it, was, it was true magic, you know, and, and the show really opened a lot of doors for me. So it was the right time. And for an entertainer to get um, primetime TV like that two weeks in a row, it was the right time for me to do it, I think. And I think that's why I turned it down for six years previous, because I wasn't ready. And, uh, you know, you, you do have to be ready in this job. And and the result was good. So, yeah. So how did you find out that you were the wild card? What was, how do you know about that? Yeah. Funny little story. On, on the Saturday, I got knocked out. Simon Cow chose Geordie O'Keefe, the singer with the guitar. And then I went home. But I was I was really elated. I was so happy that my spot went well. I could hold my head up high. I performed my ventriloquist act Saturday night, 13 million people watching live on telly. And I was happy. I was going to get some good gigs out of it. And I was happy with that. So I, I said to my wife, let's have a nice Sunday lunch. I'll go and get a bottle of Prosecco from the local m &S garage. So I walked around the garage and I heard loads of people whispering in the garage. Britain's got talent. That's what you hear for weeks. Britain's got talent. So, I, you know, they're talking about you or you hear ventriloquist, you know, and they have to do that because they've got to move their lips. All right. <laughs> and so, um, so they're doing all of this whispering. I've got my bottle of Prosecco. I, I put my debit card there and it declines right and yeah. knowing all these people behind me my cards declined there's yeah. no money yeah. no money in my bank that's what we instantly think but i know there was money in the bank yeah so i said excuse me i'll come back so they're all giggling because they know you know the tv stars got no money so i run back home come back i pay for it and then we have the roast dinner but actually in in that shop when i come back the second time to get the bottle um britain's got talent called from the, the yeah. day before I said, hi, Steve. I said, um, you're on the shortlist to be the wild card. I said, um, there's five of you. Can you um, come up with a script uh, for next Saturday, um, you know, provisionally? And, and can, you, um, can you get another puppet made, another judge? I thought, well, by Saturday, it takes months to get these, these characters drawn and sketched and and they need to source the materials. The puppet makers work so hard to, to do. It does take weeks to months, you know. If you're on a deadline, they can do it. But will they do it for me, you know, to save my bacon? So I, mm -hmm. I, um, I said, I can ask. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, but I don't think we should get another judge. I said, if you want something to go with Simon, Sunita's the obvious choice. And I think at this time. It's going to be very funny if I do a Simon and Sunita. Yeah. They, they, they said, we'll call you back in two minutes. They came back and they said, the producers love it. If you can get Sunita made. I said, but it, it's, it's not free. These characters cost £2,000. And, uh, and they said, we'll cover it. We'll pay for it. Get Sunita made and you'll find out Wednesday if you're going to be on the show. So I said, so there may be a chance that... I get this puppet made, then I'm end. I end up with Sunita in my garage that I don't need, <laughs> that I don't want, right? And, and as lovely yeah. as she is, and I do love Sunita, yeah. uh, as a person, she, she's she's great. And uh, anyway, so so I, I uh, phone up the puppet creator who's on holiday in Wales, and uh, and I say Peter Peter Pullen made all the characters, and uh, I said, can you make me a Sunita puppet by 
I think it was by Friday, the rehearsals. And he said, oh, I'm in Wales at the moment. So he was coming back from Wales. This was Sunday. He's coming back Monday. He said, I'll start it tomorrow night. He came back from Wales. He started to get all the materials and do the sketches. And then on the Tuesday, he started to build Sunita. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that was it. That's all he had. He hardly slept, bless him. And then on the Friday, I met him in London at the rehearsals. He brought the puppet to rehearsals in the morning. I went out there and I rehearsed with Simon and Sunita for the first time. It didn't get a reaction uh, I wanted it to with the crew and, and the other acts. So I was panicking a bit, thinking it's going to struggle. But um, but I didn't tell you, did I, how I got the wild card. So on the Wednesday, yeah. I'm sat down with my wife and our daughter, who's that one and a half in the middle. And the phone rings and they're filming me. They've got a TV crew in my living room. I said, just answer the phone. Uh, it's going to be one of four judges and all four of them are going to break uh, three or four good news uh, no one good news and like four bad news we can't tell you which one you are okay so I sat there, I answered the phone so, hi and I think if you watch it back because it's on YouTube uh, I, I look terrified when because I'm just thinking right they, they just want to see tears in my eyes you know sat with my wife and my baby yeah. and we're holding on to this dream anyway David Williams and, and you can hear the you know it's on loudspeaker so he says, uh, Steve, we want you to be our wild card. We've chosen you as the wild card. So David Williams phones me at the house, tells me that. And instead of jumping up and down, I'm not that sort of person. I, I just uh, get emotional and give my wife a hug, forgetting the little kid was there. Because uh, <laughs> we've shown her since she's nine now. Yeah. She loves looking at that clip because I'm hugging my wife and squashing the baby in between. <laughs> and then she's sort of looking at us to say, anyway, um, it's just very funny. So that was amazing. But then I, I knew Sunita was being made, but I still had two days to write material to go with the puppet. So I frantically wrote some new jokes. I used a couple of classics that I already had. And, and again, what you see on, on the BGT YouTube clip is, is what actually happened. So knowing that you only had a short space of time to get Sunita put together, do you have a backup plan in the case it went wrong and it didn't get made in time or... No, no. <laughs> there was no choice yeah. when you when you're in television and there's there's a but my Simon Cowell puppet since then has got into a museum in Blackpool which was supposed to open this summer but now it's going to be next summer so there, there's a the, the uh, show town in Blackpool going to be near the tower and th they've got a section of ventriloquists they've got uh, Orville the Duck and my Simon Cowell's going to be in a glass case with my BGT clips on it so they're they're you know they're, they're sort of showcasing variety and strictly come dancing dance comedy everything is there that is fantastic but um at christmas there was a britain's got talent christmas special mm. and they phoned me up to ask if i would lend david williams my simon cow puppet and the, the reason i'm telling you this is because they want things within 24 hours or 48 hours and there was no, I'd signed over the puppet and it literally, it takes weeks to do the paperwork and to get it out of the storage and things. And everyone's on furlough, so nothing's really happening up there. So I, I couldn't tell them they could borrow the puppet. I couldn't, I couldn't, it's out of my hands now, literally. Um, so I, I had to say, no, I said, yeah, I'm sorry, I, ca I can't get the Simon Cow puppet. It's in a museum. And they phoned the museum after that and tried to get it, but, but they just, couldn't uh, physically release it as easy as that you know even for the tv so uh, and i saw what um david did actually on the christmas special it, it was just a throwaway gag so it was probably worth not getting him out of the museum just for that so um it was uh, what was the question i'm diversing again you know i think it was um in the event that sunita didn't get made in time did you have a backup plan? oh yes so so what i'm saying is it that puppet had to be made for that final yeah. to work otherwise it would have just been more simon cow material and more arthur lager material which i i yeah. did i did simon and arthur but just added sunita at the end yeah. and in those in those two days my wife taught me the um shalala -la -la -da -da -ding -a -dong, you know the grease yeah. number 
I didn't know that, that song a week before. My wife made me go through it over and over again until I got it right. But everything on that final worked perfectly. That's all I needed to do was to do that, that number. But in that studio, the, the laughter is the best medicine. And in that studio, it was just the most, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's the most, I've not had any water yet. It's, it's the most electric uh, I've ever felt until like a week before it was so electric in that studio with the laughter people crying with laughter because of the Sunita thing uh Sunita was in the audience mm -hmm. and Simon was in the audience and that's why it worked yeah because they were looking at puppets of themselves and people were laughing at them laughing at the puppets so it was like a domino effect with the laughter in the studio the reaction was uh, some of the lines that I wrote for that spot I couldn't get them out because the laughter and the applause was so big and, and dragged on for quite a long time, and uh, which I'm fine with. It. It's airtime, you know, and it dragged the, the, the act on, but it didn't seem like it dragged at the time. It went just like that. But I remember coming off the stage, Ian Royce, who was the uh, warm-up man, TV warm-up, he gave me a big hug. I've worked with Ian quite a few times, and, and he went, mate, that was amazing. And uh, people were saying, you've got it in the bag. And then egg gate happened. Uh, a girl from the orchestra threw an egg. Yeah. She ruined the whole thing for me because uh, up until then I was the talk of the studio. Mm. But it was it is what it is, and it's mm. you don't have to win that show to um, to go on and be successful. You know, TV's not everything. It's uh, you know I believe I'm a success in in what I do because I love what I do, and people are still coming to the shows. So it's um, so um. Uh, do you think BGT has had an effect on the work you've got post doing it, or do you, you know, has it made you go on and do more things? Do you think it's had an effect? Yes, I do. I do more Zoom calls. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so no, what it does, it opens doors. Britain's Got yeah. Talent is one of the biggest shows you can ever be on because it's it's the original of, of the Got Talent franchise, but it's it does something, you know, and, and not. I say not a lot of people watch it. Not everyone does watch it. And I get a lot of people after shows saying, oh, I really enjoyed your show. Sorry, they apologise. Sorry, I don't watch Britain's Got Talent. And it, like, uh, you know, it doesn't matter to me if you've seen it. Because I was doing my shows before Britain's Got yeah. Talent. Uh, it's just enhanced, you know, my face. And more people come to see my shows because of Britain's Got Talent. Mm -hmm. So what it does, it's open doors. And I worked at the Royal Albert Hall. I've done a tour with Kenny G one of the greatest saxophone players uh, in the world and uh, four and a half thousand people at the Albert Hall. That was incredible. That was one door. I was shopping for beds with my wife and well, one bed, we only need <laughs> one. And, uh, and Jimmy Osmond, um, he, his tour manager phoned Tone, Tony uh, Denton, I believe. And, and he said, Jimmy uh, Osmond would like you to join him on the UK Christmas tour and then possibly go to America. And so it was, that was an incredible job. We were jumping on the beds, got chucked out of the shop. So uh, we, I went home and then Jimmy Osmond phoned. We had a great chat. And later that Christmas, I toured the UK and I went to Branson, Missouri to work the Moon River Theatre with Jimmy and his brothers, the Osmond brothers. And to, to they're one of the, the most famous uh, variety uh, bands in the world you know their tv show was them and andy williams was just incredible so i've my little ventriloquist act that was born in basingstoke has reached america working in the andy williams moon river theater with the osmonds there's just you just can't get any better than that it was it was incredible and and i i, I don't need to do the big vegas thing I, i'm just happy to support someone like jimmy and 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 do what i do you know i i'm I'm one of the ventriloquists out there. There's so many great ventriloquists out there. Uh, but I was chosen to do that um, direct in a bed mm -hmm. shop. And, and I'd done two years in America with Jimmy because of that. It was, and it, I wouldn't have got that without Britain's Got Talent. It was the YouTube clips that actually um, got me to, to those, those parts, you know. I also done um, two UK tours out of it as well. So I'd done a theatre tour. We'd done about 42 venues from Cornwall to Scotland and with my best mate, Richard Griffin, a magician. So it, doing the UK tour was another highlight. Yeah, I, I put all that down to BGT. It's, it's, 
open doors. And so um, if it, did you have work lined up if it wasn't for COVID? Like, did you have stuff like tours or anything planned? Yeah, as, as I said, the uh, Arthur Lager show was was planned. That got cancelled. And then I had Disney cruises uh, last year. I had P&O cruises. I, I had cruises and I had Butlins and uh, holiday parks, loads of private gigs. Everything obviously was wiped. And I put the Arthur Lager show on hold. I started to host a podcast in June. I phoned a, a great friend and someone I admire called Jimmy Cricket. And he is a, a, an iconic uh, comedy uh, comedian, <laughs> you know. And so I've done a podcast with him over the phone. And I'm now planning 100 podcasts. I've put out there about 45. And I'm doing 100 of those, which will take me up to September 2021. And I'm just interviewing comedians and comedy acts and comedy magicians. And because they're, they're people I've worked with over the year, or even some of my favorite sitcom characters, I've spoke to them on the phone. And it's, it, it's, it, so this has come out of COVID. I call it COVID creation. So I don't have ideas and scripts that I've written and Zoom calls, shows, interviews. And I've done so much in the last year. Uh, I've written songs. Um, I've gone back to an old sitcom I started to write 20 years ago. And I'm writing a book as well, like I say. So that book is getting edited now. The podcasts, I edit two of them a day, still recording a few more of those to get to the hundred. But um, all of this came because of COVID. So every time I'm put in a position, I work, I work on it, you know, and I uh, make something of it because it's, I can't just sit there. I've been since 12 years old. I've just been, oh, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. This has got to be done. I want to do that, you know. So I, I always go out and get it. I don't sit there and wait for the phone to ring, which it hasn't rung for years. It's all emails, isn't it? Just the emails have stopped pinging and the phone stopped ringing. So you have to create work. You have to create your own path. Yeah. Don't just sit there and do nothing. I'm a really good chef, actually. My wife loves my cooking every day. So I, I really, uh, I've always been... A bit of a good cook but my, my wife uh, says i'm i'm even better now because i've had no choice but to cook every day <laughs> so. um so one final question what advice do you have for anyone who wants to go into ventriloquism um i'd say uh, go on youtube watch loads of ventriloquists don't take the material but be inspired by the material be inspired by their ideas and if you can come up with an idea that you haven't seen before like i say be original and um, come up with a character that would be different to what, what you've seen. I keep coming up with characters and thinking that they've not been done before. Uh, and then I, I've Googled and I've found one. Like I was asked to do the, um, what was it? Uh, Britain's Got Champions or Champions Got Talent or something. Yeah. A year before the Christmas show. And um, so this is 2019. They said, oh, will you come and do... Britain's the world's got champions whatever it was called <laughs> and so I they said send us your ideas so I come up with this idea I wanted a 10 foot dummy so I wanted yeah. this huge because it's going to be at Wembley Arena and it was this huge 10 foot dummy I'm going to get that built and mm. I started to do my research and then I found in India there was a lady uh, that has a 10 foot dummy and uh, and it's a working mouth and everything and it would have cost thousands to get this made so i don't know how i would have got it done for the tv show but they phoned back to say oh that we've gone with somebody else so they didn't choose me in the end they went with paul zerdin <laughs> and so yeah. um but, but that's fine it saved me a lot of money um so, so it was um uh yeah i, I was so uh, i'll just show you this um i'm talking about advice wouldn't i advice for people so come up with characters that you've not seen before. I've never seen a genie puppet before, so mm -hmm. I thought a genie would be a great idea. Hello there, is this uh, <laughs> Dominic? Uh, Dominic, hello, <laughs> Dominic. No name. It, what's no name? You haven't got a name yet. He's very new. This is Dominic Isaac. You have three wishes. Uh, which is your first wish? <laughs> no, you're not allowed out. Stay <laughs> home. <laughs> you're stuck in the lamp. He's stuck in the lamp. <laughs> okay, there it is. You're. What's this? No, I don't want to be. I'm going back to lockdown. <laughs> so uh, he's in lockdown. So the genie is an idea I come up with uh, last year. 
because I thought it'd be wacky and and different. So um, so, so that that's good fun. So uh, yeah, to, to those budding ventriloquists out there, be original. Okay, um, I've run out of questions. I'm going to leave it there. But thank you for joining me. Um, and yes, thank you.